Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to EESI's congressional briefing this afternoon on the topic of what came out of the latest global and uh, that is much better, right? So anyway, my name is Carol Werner. I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. For any of you who have not been at uh, one of our briefings before, EESI is an organization that has been around for over 30 years. We were formed by a bipartisan congressional caucus and set up to basically be a source of of solid, credible, timely information on energy and environmental issues to work together to find ways to build consensus and to, to uh, better understand the issues, provide for better informed policy discussion, and to work together towards the identification of win-win of policy options. So, an important piece of our work for many years has been really looking at the science, the impacts of climate change. So obviously the topic before us today in terms of thinking about what really came out of the latest round of negotiations that occurred in Bonn with regard to this 23rd Conference of Parties for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a very, very important discussion that involves every member nation now of the United Nations. So I cannot uh, overstate how important these negotiations are that literally embody every country of the world as part of the negotiations now and also in terms of thinking about the impacts of climate upon all of them. So we are delighted to have with us this afternoon a panel that brings enormous expertise and a variety of perspectives with regard to thinking about climate. Uh, people that were uh, involved in this latest round of negotiations and in terms also of providing leadership there. And we are especially privileged to have with us this afternoon the uh, president of the COP23 of this 23rd Conference of Parties, the ambassador of Fiji, Solomar, who is Fiji's ambassador to the US, and he has an enormous amount of experience and had received his uh, advanced uh, a graduate degree in international relations from the International University of Japan, and he has more than 15 years experience at the Fiji Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's also important to think about this particular role that he has held in terms of he's been the High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Ambassador to Germany, Denmark, Israel, Ireland, and the Holy See. And he had also been the Permanent Secretary of Foreign Affairs uh, for three years and had served as a counselor at the Fiji Embassy in Brussels. So he brings an enormous wealth of diplomatic experience and also looking firsthand at what climate means to an island nation and what it means in terms of providing leadership internationally. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you uh, very much, Carol, for that uh, introduction and uh, also for EESI for this uh, opportunity uh, to tell our story uh, from the perspective of a small island uh, uh, developing uh, state in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, to us, COP23 was significant uh, because it marked the first time a small island developing state presided over the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change process. At the outset, Fiji's strong desire was to make COP23 a visionary one, transforming what was initially expected to be a technical COP, one that is focusing primarily on the details of the Paris guidelines, and make it into an uh, inspirational political momentum for implementation. This was achieved by putting a human face and story 
to the recent devastating extreme weather events that have affected millions of people across the globe with heat waves, droughts, tropical cyclones, and dust storm. And Fiji did this by introducing a uniquely Pacific Island cultural concept known as the Mbulu spirit to the climate conference, which infused both the formal negotiations and the climate action zone with a sense of urgency, warmth, inclusiveness, and transparency. For a process that in the past has often been viewed as closed off and disconnected from the lives of ordinary people, COP23 legacy was the introduction of the first open states and observer dialogue. Government and civil society dis discussed uh, key issues related to the negotiations, discussed uh, implementation of ambitions and how to engage the civil society better in national and international climate action. There was general acceptance at the conference that the development challenge posed by climate change is not for government to resolve alone. By putting people first and showcasing the human face of the impact of climate change, we wanted COP23 to make a connection between these complex negotiations and the real everyday concern and aspirations of people living at the front line of the impact of climate change. The opening of the high-level segment of COP23, for example, featured students from rural Fijian schools affected badly by climate change. They shared the reality of living under the devastation of a Category 5 hurricane and how the community struggled to recover after the event. Telling these stories from around the world as part of the dialogue, the Fijian presidency created the, in our view, an ideal political environment to advance the discussion for the implementation guidelines for the Paris Agreement and prepare for more ambitious action through the dialogue process we termed as the Talanoa in 2018. The Talanoa is a Pacific Island construct where village elders gathered to discuss important issues with a view of seeking a win-win solution for the community rather than individuals. And it is premised on building trust amongst participants. So this process of exchanging information and understanding each other's position is critical in this process of Talanot. And the Talanot dialogue agreed to in Bonn establishes an inclusive and participatory process that will allow governments, scientists, researchers, the private sector, and the civil society to share stories and showcase best practices on how to raise the ambition of nationally determined contributions. As we all know, there are two major challenges to the nationally determined contribution, which outline the target or plan that a country has on reducing their CO2 footprint. And the first challenge is that they differ widely in terms of methodologies, timelines, sectors, and scope. And secondly, when you add all the targets together, they do not limit global temperature to the level that we need. Currently, with the US commitments, it stands at somewhere between 2.3 and 3 degrees increase. The Paris Agreement intends to keep global temperature increases to below 2 degrees. And for the Pacific Islands' continuing existence, we seek to cap it at 1.5 degrees. And scientists have told us that we are already at one degree rise, so we must take action now, and all the NDCs must scale up dramatically. The US withdrawal, though, the second largest emitter in the world, will be a huge blow to this, uh, to this effort. At COP23, though, Negotiators discussed how to align the NDCs and the methods by which countries can revise them to increase their ambition and urgency. This process is an important element in the Paris Agreement implementation guidelines. The Talanoa dialogue to take place in 2018 will be the first opportunity where countries officially take stock of their progress on their NDCs. 
At COP23, some information shared gives hope to this process. China announced it will be creating a national carbon market. The EU, EU has ambitious climate legislation. Mexico and Canada are working together to increase cooperation on climate change. India is massively scaling up renewable energy. France has declared it will make up for lost funding to uh, climate uh, organizations like IPCC. And even domestically in the US, according to America's pledge, more than 2,500 non-federal actors rep representing a good size of the US economy, including cities, counties, states, businesses, and more, have pledged their support to the, for the Paris Agreement goals. If these actors were their own country, they'd be the world's third largest uh, economy. But a key part of reducing emissions, as indicated in the NDCs, is to increase renewable energy and energy efficiency. There were a number of announcements made on the margins of the negotiations, which offer support to countries to address their NDCs, one of which was the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, which brings together 25 countries states and regions to accelerate the rapid phase out of coal and support affected workers and communities to make the transition. There was also an NDC support program by the UNDP, Germany, Spain, and the EU, which totaled 42 million uh, euros to assist the countries deliver on their pledges under the Paris Agreement. There was also an NDC partnership regional hub uh, to be set up in the, the Pacific. It will provide expertise for developing regional solutions to mitigate global warming and enhance the efforts of the Pacific Islands to adapt to climate change. And uh, the IEA, the Energy, uh, International Energy Agencies, also announced a 30 million uh, euro clean energy transition program to support countries uh, around the world. At the high-level presidency event on insurance and resilience, a go uh, global partnership was uh, forged and uh, was known as the Fiji Clearing House for Risk Transfer. This clearing house has the potential to provide millions of climate vulnerable people all over the world with access to affordable insurance against climate-related loss and damage, such as display displacement. COP23 aimed to further strengthen the UNFCCC Warsaw mechanism uh, on loss and damage. And uh, one of the significant uh, outcomes too, uh, as far as Fiji is concerned, was the launching of the Ocean Pathway Partnership uh, at COP23. This is to us a ma major new initiative to strengthen the link uh, between uh, climate change action and the health of the ocean to have this properly recognized both in the UN climate change process as well as in national climate action uh, plans. COP23 also adopted the first gender action plan and operationalized the local communities and indigenous peoples platform. These initiatives are to ensure that those who are traditionally marginalized have a strong voice in climate change negotiations and victims of climate change are empowered to become uh, agents of change. Under COP23, there will uh, be more funding for climate uh, adaptation uh, programs, but uh, one area where the success of uh, the COP23 process uh, was highlighted was in the area of agriculture. We all know that uh, small-scale farmers are amongst the most vulnerable to the impacts of uh, climate change. So after six years of intense uh, negotiation, an agreement on agriculture was concluded at COP23. And this joint work on agriculture will help developing uh, countries uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural uh, sector, which is the second biggest emitter after the uh, energy sector. This will also help promote the sector's resilience to the effects of climate change. So overall, COP23, uh, from our view, uh, has embraced the concept of a grand 
Coalition for Greater Ambition, in bond the support for climate action from countries, regions, cities, civil society, the private sector, and ordinary men and women was uh, clearly on display in the organized high-level events on health, policy coherence, human rights, and climate change, insurance and resilience, and the 2050 Pathway Platform, which all aims to deliver in the coming years concrete results. All these events, uh, I might add, were well attended and resulted in uh, real energy around the issues of climate policy in the context of national policy formulation uh, within society. I will stop here in the interest of time and will elaborate uh, uh, further during the Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Mara. Thank you. So that was a lot that was coming out, and I think that we will all need to really look at a lot of these agreements and, and stages in much more depth so that we can understand all of the different places at which we all can play a role. And so we are now going to hear from Anton Huffnagel, who is the first Secretary for Climate, Environmental, and Urban Affairs with the Embassy of Germany. And it has been a pleasure to work with Anton since he uh, came to the embassy. Um, he is responsible for quite a diverse portfolio, including climate, environment, and urban development. Uh, but because this is also, because it's also been the year of Germany holding the G20 presidency, and also with COP23 being in Bonn, Anton's focus has necessarily really been on international climate policy. He previously worked for Germany's federal ministry for the environment, nature, conservation, building and nuclear safety in Bonn, and he also had uh, worked in London for JP Morgan. And it's been wonderful working with Anton in his capacity at the embassy. Welcome. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for uh, the great introduction. We had a, um, a short conversation before, before the talk today, and you said you were only going to talk about um, how the COP affected Fiji. I think you've, you've pretty much covered the entire COP and a lot of the, a lot of the achievements there. Um, so I'm going to see what, what I really will talk about now. Um, but I think I have prepared a, um, a presentation. I'm, Apologize for the, the date down there. That's actually the last time I presented here with the ESI. <laughs> and that, that uh, kind of uh, didn't catch my attention. Uh, the COP23 in Bonn, uh, Further Faster Together, that's actually the, the official title of the, um, the closing statement that was agreed on um, by the now um, 197 parties um, to the United Nations Framework Convention, but also um, to the Paris Agreement. So actually in Bonn or in the, in the weeks leading up to Bonn, uh, we saw um, the two remaining parties that had yet abstained from the, the Paris Climate Convention, um, the government of Nicaragua and the government of Syria joined the Paris Agreement as well, um, thereby um, giving the Paris Agreement the, the universal support um, of course, there's been conversations in, in this country whether the United States will um, eventually leave the agreement or, or not. Um, but as it stands, we, we do have 197 signatories to the agreement. So every single party to the Framework Convention from 1992 has now decided to, to join the Paris Agreement as well. Um, so why did we have COP23 in Bonn? Uh, it was, a, I think, a, a first that the nation that was officially hosting uh, the COP and was president to the COP, Fiji, um, decided to cooperate with another government, in this case Germany, um, to host the COP um, on the Rhine and not on, um, on one of the islands in, in Fiji. And I think it was mostly for uh, logistical reasons. Uh, we had 22,000 participants at COP23. Uh, it would have been very hard for, for Fiji to, to deal with those numbers. And also we wanted to um, to have as little impact on the environment as possible. So we were able to stage a COP that was, that was completely carbon-free, emissions neutral, 
Um, and that was easier to do in Bonn than, than perhaps in Fiji. Um, but the, uh, the, the great thing about, about this COP was that it was the first COP that was, that was hosted by a small island uh, developing state, small island nation, um, a nation that's at the forefront of climate change, a nation that has made significant pledges through its nationally determined uh, contribution um, and was now for the first time able to, um, to lead the negotiations and, and did a great job at that. Um, so we offered to assist. Um, and the location in Bonn was not coincidental. It's, um, it's the, the headquarters of the United Nations Framework Convention Secretariat that have been hosted in Bonn uh, for close to two decades now. Um, and has really um, kind of shown the development of Bonn from a, a Cold War capital uh, for four decades, uh, from 1949 to 1990, um, that has now been turned into um, a significant United Nations headquarters um, and also the United Nations Capital of Sustainability. Uh, there's about 19 UN organizations now based in Bonn, many of them using uh, previous government locations, previous ministerial buildings, um, and are all focusing on sustainability and the kind of questions that we as a world need to come together to solve climate change, of course, being, uh, being the key challenge among them. Um, why, is, why is Germany uh, so involved and uh, why have we been so, uh, so vocal about climate change? Uh, Germany represents about 2.16% of global emissions. If we decarbonize entirely, which is what we have pledged to do by 2050, the effect on the climate will be relatively insignificant. Uh, Fiji um, represents 0.04% of global emissions. Um, even if we, as we did, partnered, um, the effect wouldn't be uh, necessary to achieve a two-degree goal, three-degree goal, possibly even a four-degree goal. Uh, so Germany has found very early that cooperation is essential. Um, we have been a party of the Kyoto Agreement. Um, we have now in, in, in Bonn announced that, um, the signing of the, the successor to the Kyoto Agreement, uh, the Doha Amendment to the Kyoto Agreement. And of course, we've been involved in negotiations leading to the Paris Agreement and have now hosted this COP. Um, the, the conference in, in COP was one of uh, the, the so-called interim conferences. So there's a, a much larger conference every three years. Um, the last happened in Paris in, in 2015, um, where all nations, and this is the first not just the developed nations, not just the industrialized nations, but the developing nations as well, have committed together to the two degree goal. Um, so um, there's a lot of talking about deals that are better or worse. Um, the, the, major, the major achievement of the Paris Agreement was to get everyone on the table and have everyone commit equally to this, to this goal. Um, and as I said, Right now, we have 197 parties to the Paris Agreement. Um, what happened in, in, in Paris was, of course, this milestone of the Paris Agreement. Um, what sometimes happens in international negotiations is that a milestone really then needs to be implemented, um, and we need to decide on how exactly we're going to implement this. And this is what has happened in, in Marrakesh, in, in Morocco last year, what is happening, what has happened in, in, in Bonn this year, and what is going to happen in, in, in Katowice and Poland next year at COP24 when we will finalize our rule book for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, basically coming up with a, a coherent common framework for how do we communicate our contributions to the protection of the climate, um, how do we assist developing nations in, in, uh, in making their contributions, and how do we how do we be as transparent as possible about what we've actually achieved um, so the Paris Agreement can really come together. In, in Bonn, for the very first time, uh, and I think the, uh, the ambassador has already alluded to this, uh, we had two zones at the conference. So we had the Bula zone, uh, which is Fiji for, for welcome, and we had the Bonn zone. The Bula zone was, um, was the one that was kind of the traditional COP. It was where uh, national negotiation teams would come together and for those two weeks try to find as much agreement as possible to prepare the, um, the finalization of the rule book and, 
in, in Katowice next year. Um, and I think we've, we've made significant progress, um, again, under the, uh, under the, uh, the, the Fijian presidency and their, and their talent for, for bringing as many of us um, together as possible. Um, and we've now come up with uh, a kind of collection of texts that will then be uh, the basis for the, the rule book. Um, so really what has happened in Bonn was that every country brought to the table its, its drafts for the rule book. Uh, we, we looked at those. Some of those were, were accepted for a kind of preliminary text collection. Um, some of those were merged. Some of those eventually were, were dropped from the table. But we now have a collection of texts that will form the basis for the, the next negotiations, which will continue in, in 2018 at a preliminary conference and then hopefully be finalized in, in Katowice. And of course, something that, already, that also has happened um, in, in Bonn is that we don't just look at the post-2020 phase. Because the Paris Agreement really relates to climate action after 2020. Originally, it was envisaged that uh, the Paris Agreement potentially only come into force in, in 2020. Uh, of course, action here in the United States, which is one of the first large nations to, to ratify the Paris Agreement, and then the European Union and so many other nations, Fiji again among them, have led to a much faster coming into force of the Paris Agreement. But most of the, um, most of the, most of the convention really applies to post-2020. And the rule book that we're defining now will refer to what will be done after 2020. Now, of course, a lot of nations um, are pushing us to commit to actions before 2020. Um, this has happened through the uh, Kyoto Agreement. It's, it's happening through the, the Doha Amendment to the Kyoto Agreement, which will last until 2020, kind of building that bridge to Paris. Um, but many nations, including, again, the small island developing states, have said, really, we need to peak emissions before 2020. And we need transparency, and we need commitment by industrialized nations. Um, and we need the funding so we can make our first steps. Um, and this has led to the, uh, the, the, what was called the facilitated dialogue before, where we kind of prepare um, in a, in a pre-2020 fashion our, our commitments. And it's now called the, the Telenoa dialogue. And I think the ambassador has, has made clear what that means. Um, and the, the global community has accepted that the Telenoa dialogue will now launch, or was launched at the COP, and will officially begin um, early next year. Um, so what are we really talking about when we're talking about climate change in the international context? Um, it's really three pillars. Um, it's the mitigation, so the, uh, the reduction of emissions that we need in order to achieve the two degree goal or potentially uh, the, the 1.5 degree goal. Um, it's the adaptation um, where countries adapt to that climate change which will be, uh, will be happening even under those scenarios. And then finally it's support where we help countries um, of lesser financial means um, in, their, in their efforts to either mitigate or adapt to climate change. Um, what happened in in Bonn uh, was again that we uh, we decided on the on we prepared the <laughs> negotiations for the rule book and they're supposed to be finalized by by 2018 next year um, and we looked at what can we do before 2020 and those were very hard negotiations because a lot of countries are arguing well really the Paris Agreement that we've signed up to only relates to after 2020 so why should we already contributing to, um, to these things um, right now. But we have found agreement on um, a stock taking effort that will take place in 2018 and 2019, which relates to the mitigation aspect. Um, so how, how much have we contributed so far to the mitigation of climate change on a, on a national basis? Um, and how much is still needed then for the goals to be achieved? Um, and we have agreed on preliminary assessments of, of climate finance contributions. So in, uh, in Paris, or even uh, shortly before that, the industrialized world agreed to contribute $100 billion per year after 2020 um, to adaptation and mitigation efforts by the developing world. Um, there has now been um, 
some, uh, some anxiety around that goal, um, especially with uh, signals coming, coming from Washington um, that potentially climate, climate finance uh, would no longer be priority of this government. Um, and countries are, um, especially the developing world, is, is asking us where, where is the 100 billion coming from now? Um, and we have reacted and we have, we have agreed to, um, to assess the contributions in 2018 and again in 2020 um, in order to, to produce trust in the developing world that they will then also go ahead um, with, their, with, their, uh, with their contributions and their um, raising of ambition for mitigation and adaptation going forward. Um, And again, the, the new element in, in, in bond was the aptly called bond zone, uh, where for the first time, the civil society kind of had its, had its own place. Uh, of course, negotiators would, would come there and meet with the civil society and you know, there'd be uh, side events um, on a massive scale. Um, but it was the first time that this non-state element really had its own, its own space in the, in the UNFCCC context. And I think it worked great. I mean, we have two representatives of the non-state element sitting here on the table with us today. Um, so that shows that um, how, just how important that is, especially here in the United States. Um, we had the, the NDC partnership hosting a number of events in the, in the climate action zone, in the bond zone. The NDC partnership is a, a partnership of developed nations, developing nations, and a, and a few NGOs that was formed uh, was formed in Marrakesh last year, so it was really celebrating its, its first anniversary in, in Bonn, and that is, is, is partnering developed nations and developing nations in order to come together on, on um, how, do I, how do I formulate my NDCs um, given, given national conditions, and then how do I implement them, and is, is really supporting nations in, in raising ambitions through their NDCs and then the implementation of NDCs, which, which are the cornerstones of the Paris Agreement. Again, the nationally determined contributions are a piece that is, is really outside of the Paris Agreement, so we, we don't have, we don't have uh, they're not part of the treaty, um, which also means that they can be changed by nations um, as they feel appropriate. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of conversation on the, the US NDC um, and how, how that potentially um, can be changed. Um, but it, it's important to know that accession to the Paris Agreement um, does, not, does not set in stone the NDC and was really meant to be that way from the beginning because we want to ratchet up ambition over time so NDCs are for a five-year period. And then after that, during those five years, we see where can we increase ambition now. Um, what has really, what has really been important in, in Bonn again was the, the non-state contributions. Um, I think one thing that that kind of struck everybody um, was the the tremendous the tremendous um, delegation from subnational non-state actors coming from the United States. We had four U.S. governors on the ground. Um, we had. Um, teams from, from other states. We had a, a number of mayors coming to Bonn. We had a, a large US business community representation. Um, and what's been universal to that delegation is that they pledged continued support to the Paris Agreement. Um, a lot of these governors um, organized through the US Climate Alliance have pledged again that um, they will use the, the, the current United States NDC, which is to lower emissions by uh, by 26 to 28 percent by 2025 as their guideline going forward, which is really showing to us that um, even if there's concern on the federal level, even if there's criticism on the federal level, um, a large part of the economy um, that is then responsible for emissions, even here in the U.S., has accepted the irreversibility of the Paris Agreement. And, and what really hasn't happened in, in, in Bonn uh, was a renegotiation of the Paris Agreement that's been demanded by some. Um, and the further faster together kind of, kind of um, supports that notion that the Paris Agreement is here to stay in its current form. Um, and then we just need to make sure that it's, um, that it's an, an, an agreement that's welcoming to, to more actors. So it's welcoming to the subnational community. It's welcoming to, to indigenous communities. And I think we've done that with a, a new forum that was also supported by Fiji, um, is, is welcoming to the business community and so on. Um, 
we've seen that in, at the, the conference in Paris uh, last week that was especially focusing on climate finance and what the business community can do. Um, so that is a, an encouraging sign that came from the COP. What was Germany doing at the COP23? Um, we were in the middle of coalition negotiations in Berlin. Um, so it was, it was somewhat bad timing. We were hosting the largest international conference in the history of Germany, uh, 22,000 participants in Bonn, in the old capital. In the new capital, um, parties were just then trying to uh, negotiate the, uh, the rules for a new government. Uh, finally, that, that attempt was unsuccessful. A new attempt is beginning right now after the elections. Um, but we were present in, in Bonn. Actually, this is our, our president, um, Mr. Steinmeier, um, making, making the opening speech there, just as, as proof that uh, German politicians did travel. Uh, the chancellor was, uh, was there and made the, made the national speech for Germany. Um, and we've made a, a number of contributions related to the mitigation, but also to the, um, the financing aspect. Of course, our, our mitigation framework has been, um, has been set by, by um, almost eight years now. Um, these are goals that were defined in, in 2010 um, as the four goals of the energy transition. And these are kind of the, uh, the, the near-term goals um, so we um, set that on a national level, we will have 40 to 45 percent renewables by 2025, lower emissions by 40 percent, have an energy efficiency target, uh, which will in decrease energy consumption by, by 2020. So those are our national or domestic energy transition efforts. Um, in, the, in the longer term, by 2050, the Climate Action Plan unveiled in, in Marrakesh last year is then setting uh, a longer term target for 2050, which is to effectively decarbonize our economy. Um, and that long term framework, I think, uh, or we think is important to, uh, to create certainty for investors to effectively go into these markets. Um, our contributions to climate finance, again, uh, we, we support the 100 billion pledge uh, by, by 2020 have again reiterated this pledge in, in 15, 16, and now in 17, um, and have, um, I think this is Germany's um, kind of federal government climate finance, business climate finance, and um, finance coming from financial sector is again independent, um, but these are the numbers for the last 10 years, 16 and 17 aren't yet on here, but I think it shows a, um, a very clear trajectory to where we wanna be. Uh, in 2015, the Chancellor has announced that we want to again double our climate aid by 2020. Um, so we will eventually uh, be contributing just on the federal level about 4 billion euros per year to international climate finance. Only in Bonn, um, we have made additional commitments to the Adaptation Fund and to the Least Developed Countries Fund. Um, of 50 million each, and we have pledged 110 million euros for something called the Insa Resilience Global Partnership. This is a scheme that will um, support insurances, climate insurances, uh, especially for small developing states. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been created uh, in, in 2016 at Marrakesh. That's when we announced it. The first payouts actually came after the hurricanes in the Caribbean this year. Um, so there's been some, there's been some bilateral support um, to, to these countries, to these small island states in the Caribbean affected by the, the hurricane season of 2017. Um, but there's also a, a kind of long-term solution, which is this insular resilience framework. And the first payouts um, have, come out, have come out this year so that it's working and we're creating um, trust in that community. Um, is all of this in our national interest? Uh, we believe yes, absolutely so. Um, Germany is a, uh, a manufacturing economy, it's a knowledge economy. So if we're able to uh, bring forward the, the energy transition in, in other countries, and if we're able to help other countries with our technology, with our kind of integrated energy solutions, um, it doesn't just make sense from a political point of view, it makes sense from an economic point of view. And I think the, um, the speakers after me will 
will reflect on that as well. Um, the other point that's, um, that's really been um, at the top of everybody's mind, in, in Europe at least, is the climate security nexus. So how does climate risk turn into, turn into security risk? And we believe that a, uh, a national security strategy that does not take climate risk into account is, is not complete. Um, and we've had a number of, uh, of side events in, in Bonn where we've alluded to, to our work. Um, one of those is a integrated security analysis for the, the, Chad, uh, the Chad Lake in Africa, uh, where you have a, uh, a region that is under tremendous threat from, from climate change, is also uh, facing risks of political and economic stability. And we are um, now developing a framework of how do we analyze these risks and how, how do we cope these risks in an integrated development approach. Um, and that is what I would like to close my presentation with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. And as uh, Anton referred uh, in his remarks that half of our panel is also representing this subnational um, group that uh, was part of COP23 and was a very significant factor in terms of the number of people, the range of interests, uh, and commitment and excitement that was all part of these negotiations. And we will first hear from Sam Ricketts, who is the Director of Federal and Interstate Affairs uh, in Governor Jay Inslee's Washington, D.C. office. Sam leads that work, and uh, Sam had uh, previously uh, worked for then Congressman Jay Inslee, and in the course of that, he, had, uh, um, he was the Executive Director of the U.S. House Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, which was a caucus that had been formed by Congressman Inslee uh, and, and also Congressman Steve Israel at that point. And the whole idea behind that was to really promote clean energy and climate action within, within, the, within the House. And in his role uh, as, in terms of leading Governor Inslee's Washington office, he is the governor's chief liaison with the federal government, uh, with Congress, and also with the National and Western Governors Association, and helps on all manner of federal policies that affect Washington state. Because Governor Inslee was one of the four governors in Bonn, he, uh, we thought that it was very important to have Sam here to talk about the whole role of governors, of, of the leadership coming out of states and local governments uh, with regard to climate. And of course, Governor Inslee has been leading efforts both within Washington state and also in certainly within the North, uh, Pacific Northwest and in uh, uh, relations with also various Canadian provinces as well as there are regional efforts underway to really look at how to best address climate and greenhouse emissions. Sam? Uh, great. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you, EESI, for another great briefing. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you to my, to my fellow panelists, especially to uh, to the ambassador and, and to Anton and for your work and for your country's leadership in hosting the COP and, and hosting the governor and governors uh, this year uh, and your ongoing work. And again, thanks everyone for, for being here to talk about this important subject. Um, again, my name is Sam Ricketts. I handle federal interstate affairs for Washington State Governor Inslee. Um, the, uh, we like to consider ourselves the greenest and one of the best countries in the, uh, states in the country. Um, right off the bat, just starting, this is the headline of the statement that that Governor Inslee and our state issued, um, along with actually other governors, uh, in, in the lead up to the Bonn uh, uh, Climate Conference, in the, in the lead up to COP23. And you see here it says, U.S. governors head to Germany to reassure global, to reassure global leaders of American leadership on climate change. I think generally you'd expect um, uh, a different entity to be showing up on behalf of the United States to assure global leaders of, of, of American leadership on climate change, but clearly given the direction that the United States government has chosen to go in vis-a-vis 
the Paris Agreement and international climate collaboration, um, we felt it was particularly important for American governors to be present at, in Bonn this year to talk with global leaders about how the United States is continuing to move forward on climate, on climate action. Um, just by way of background, Washington State, located in the, in the upper northwest of the country, um, we've got our own unique challenges that we're facing right now today in climate change. Governor Inslee understands this is a, a moral imperative to act upon climate change, that it's, that it's uh, an issue that's not off in the future, that it's in fact having damaging effects on our state and on the, on the global community as we speak. Just in Washington, we've experienced uh, two of the worst wildfire seasons in our, nation, in our state's history just in the last four years. Um, ocean acidification increasingly on, on, our, on our coastal communities along with, with um, uh, sea level rise and storm surge have been impacting coastal communities. Water resources are already being strained in parts of the state where or actually other parts of the state are growing wetter uh, and we're seeing more uh, mudslides and storm surge and more, and more flooding, all as a result of what climate projections have, in, have projected, which is these things are, 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 are now and are going to be increasing as a result of, of climate change. So in response, Governor Inslee has, has pursued an aggressive agenda within Washington state for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and building a clean energy economy for the 21st century. Now, specifically, the governor has pursued policies in partnership with the legislature and through executive order. He's implemented a, a clean air rule to cap and reduce carbon emissions from the largest sources across the economy in the state. We're phasing out the use of coal power, both by closing our, our final coal plant within the state by 2025 and also reducing and phasing out the use of imported coal power in, electric, in our electricity systems. Uh, he's worked with the legislature to create a clean energy fund that is investing in, in breakthrough technologies, both in their development and in their deployment. Like, like battery storage used with renewables to clean up the grid and the electricity sector. We're one of the leading states when it comes to penetration of electric vehicles in the personal vehicle fleet. Uh, and there's ongoing conversations between the governor and the state legislature about the future of carbon pricing and possibly joining other, our, uh, some of our fellow states in, in putting a price on and, and thereby reducing carbon pollution. Um, but it wasn't, so th this is all the backdrop that, that Governor Inslee used to take to Bonn to argue for the need for continued climate action and, and demonstrate particularly that Washington State, as, as well as along with other states, is continuing to take action to reduce carbon pollution. Um, obviously this in contrast with some of the remarks and certainly the policy agenda set here in Washington, D.C. by the federal government. But, it, but Inslee was not alone. Uh, four governors, the largest delegation of United States governors to attend a COP were in Bonn uh, in November this year. Uh, four governors attended, Governor Inslee, his counterparts, Governors Jerry Brown and Kate Brown from California and Oregon, and Governor Terry McAuliffe from Virginia. Um, there have been governors attending COPs in the past. Governor Inslee was pleased enough to be in Paris in 2015 when the historic Paris Agreement was signed. He's attended past agreement past COPs as well. He was in Copenhagen, for instance, in 2009 as a congressman uh, representing, you know, as part of the congressional delegation that attended that. But this was, this was crucial. This was a year that governors felt it was going to be important to be there, as I said, to speak with the global community about uh, American leadership continuing, even here in 2017, in reducing carbon and pollution and working with the global community to address this moral and global imperative. Uh, particularly, each of these governors is a member of the United States Climate Alliance. Uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance was founded in literally the days after uh, President Trump announced the United States' intention to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, it has grown to 15 members. Uh, it was, uh, was led by and is co-chaired and co-founded by Governor Inslee and Governor Cuomo from New York and Governor Jerry Brown from California. Uh, it has grown to 15 members, 14 states and one territory, Puerto Rico, um, a bipartisan coalition, both Democratic and Republican governors who are committed to uh, reducing the carbon pollution, working together to advance and continue American leadership on climate change. Each of the four governors that attended the COP is a member of the U.S. Climate Alliance, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Climate Alliance activities in the COP. But in addition, I should mention there were six other governors who were represented by senior advisors or by uh, their agency officials over in Germany, uh, also speaking about their state's action in 2017 and, and, and going forward. Uh, this was obviously all part of the broader community of subnational actors and non-governmental actors who, uh, who went to Bonn from the United States to say, we are still in, we are still committed to the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, business Council for Sustainable Energy obviously had a presence. Biz the business community writ large from the United States, as you've seen a, a strong outpouring of support for continuing carbon reductions and continuing to build clean energy and, and a, a cleaner, more sustainable future for our country. Uh, there were 
uh, universities, there were NGOs, there, there were cities, of course, present as well. Uh, the, uh, you, you may have heard of the We Are Still In Coalition, as well as America's Pledge, launched by Jerry Brown and, and Mayor, former Mayor Bloomberg. All this strong outpouring of support from civil society and subnational governments in the, in the wake of President Trump's announcement about pulling out of the Paris Agreement, all demonstrating that the United States is still committed, even if our federal government uh, perhaps is taking a time out from being committed to climate action. Um, the alliance principles that each of these states have, 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 have declared themselves behind are the states are, are, are right now confronting and leading on climate change. States are continuing to lead. For about 20 years, states have been the foremost actors in the United States, one could argue, as I would, in, in reducing carbon pollution and building out clean energy. And this predates the Obama administration even. This dates back to at least the beginning of this century. Um, uh, state level climate action is benefiting our economies and strengthening our communities. That again is an action is something uh, the states that are part of the United States Climate Alliance have actually seen as they've taken steps to reduce their carbon and build clean energy. They've seen their economies grow faster than the rest of the U.S. at large. Washington State actually has the fastest growing economy in the country. We led the nation in GDP growth last year. We believe, we believe that is tied and intricately tied to the fact that we believe in innovation. We believe in the forward looking economy in Washington State. Uh, states are showing, the, fi the final bullet, the principles behind the climate alliance is that states are showing the nation and the world that ambitious climate action I is achievable. And indeed, this relates to what California is doing. This relates to what the northeast state, northeastern states are doing with Reggie. Uh, states are acting right now. It is benefiting our economies. It, it is benefiting our states. We feel it is a imperative both for our states to reduce carbon pollution and protect against these worst climate impacts for our economies to lead the the, the world in these 21st century technologies and for the global community and the climate impacts that we must avoid. Uh, lest you think uh, 15 states, big whoop, uh, we've, the, what about the other 35? Let me um, make sure to share with you that the United States Climate Alliance represents 36% of, of U.S. population. Uh, climate Alliance states represent $7 trillion in U.S. GDP, about 40% of overall GDP in the United States. Uh, Climate Alliance members are also home to 1.3 million clean energy jobs. Again, this relates to the fact that Climate Alliance states have been focusing on building these parts of these economies. I mentioned the things we're doing in Washington state. That has led to us being one of the top 10 states in wind energy. We are home to some innovative solar manufacturers. We are home to a burgeoning battery technology sector based in part by the investments, the market certainties, the attraction that we want to bring to those, those industries that we feel are going to lead the global um, the, the global race for clean energy technologies. Uh, addition, the, the, the United States Climate Alliance, the, the members who have committed themselves, the governors who have signed up and said, I want to be part of this forward-thinking alliance, uh, to commit themselves really is important to realize it really to three things, three and a half, um, uh, that their states will meet or exceed the targets of the, United, of the, of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, the United States, as we mentioned, has set, its, has set for itself its NDC a target of 26 to 28 percent reduction emissions reductions by to using 2005 levels by 2025. Um, uh, these states each commit that they're going to do their part in, in re meeting or exceeding that target for their own state. Um, these states, importantly, cannot cannot. We don't believe these states can can subsume and can take the entirety of the U.S. NDC on themselves. There is too much carbon emissions from too many other parts of the country. But these states are committed to working together to take to meet or exceed their parts of it, and to working together to go further faster. Furthermore, these states are committed to meeting or exceeding their targets as set by the Clean Power Plan um, that that the EPA was previously implementing. Um, and furthermore, the other two elements that are crucial is we feel these states are committed to demonstrating their leadership and their action to the domestic political community. Uh, the, right, the United States needs to know that states are continuing to lead, and importantly, the global community needs to know that states are continuing to work on carbon reductions and clean energy. And then finally, and this is probably most exciting, is that these states are committed to working together to go further faster. We're, we're actively working. We've set up working groups. We're exploring policy and, and, in, and partnerships in financing deployment of clean energy, in tracking emissions data, which, as you know, is, is an enormous policy undertaking of its own, in working together on natural and working lands and their relation to climate solutions. Um, we think that by, by collaborating across state lines, we'll be, even, we'll be able to go even further, even faster in reducing carbon pollution and fighting for a clean energy future. Um, I mentioned the, the U.S. Climate Alliance and its some, other, some of the other stats, and that, of course, brings us all to Bonn.
and the presence the United States Climate Alliance governors had, Governor Inslee and three of his colleagues had in, in Bonn. Uh, some of the announcements that, that we thought were crucial, we felt were crucial and wanted to bring to the international community, um, well, I, I guess a, a few things. The goal of governors being there, as I stated, was to assure the global community that, st that America is not out of the climate game, so to speak, that we have states and, and strong actors within the United States and states arguably are among the strongest in the energy sector. We have uh, pretty broad jurisdiction over our energy systems, over our transportation systems. States uh, arguably can be one of the most effective movers of climate policy in the country, and, and indeed we've seen that over the last 20 years. Uh, importantly, the states who are there, Governor Inslee and, and his colleagues, were separate and apart from the formal United States delegation. Obviously, the State Department was present. The United States is still a member of the UNFCCC. It is still a member of the Paris Climate Agreement. It can't formally remove itself until 2020. Uh, so there was a delegation from the United States there, and they speak for the country and its federal government. But as I stated, it's, our governors felt it was vitally important to be there, along with the other elements of civil society from the United States, and obviously along with the global community to demonstrate continued partnership and action uh, on, climate, on climate change. Uh, the governors involved them, were involved in multilateral discussions with, with other nations' leaders, were involved in bilateral discussions aimed at furthering partnerships with other specific nations and subnational actors around the country. Now, some of the announcements that the governors uh, brought forward in, in Bonn, and even previous, I've, I've got up here on the slide for you, uh, the one on the, in the, in the upper left-hand corner is a report that was issued by the Climate Alliance uh, in partnership with the Rhodium Group actually back in September in New York City as part of the UN Climate Week. Uh, and that is a report that says Alliance states taking the lead that demonstrated that Alliance states with their actions to date are on track, our 15 states and, and territories are on track to, uh, to meet or exceed our Paris goals by 2025. Uh, as, we st as we stand right now, the, our states have taken aggressive enough action that we're on track to meet those targets. We're obviously seeking to go even further, even faster. In addition, uh, the picture in the, in the middle of the center there, you've got Governor Inslee and Governor Brown, along with the environmental ministers from Mexico and Canada. The Climate Alliance, together with Mexico and Canada, issued a North American Climate Leadership Statement and uh, have initiated what's going to be called the North American Climate Leadership Dialogue. Again, this is normally a role that's, that, that the State Department and the United States government would take on, but Canada and Mexico recognize the power that these states working together will have, and we are now going to be working together to set up a dialogue where we can collaborate as states with our, with our neighbors to the north and the south on a North American climate leadership dialogue. And that's going to continue up to and including and beyond uh, the, the large-scale climate summit that our friends in California are planning to host in September 2018. Um, as well up there, you see we've, um, the, the, the bottom headline, United States Climate Alliance partners with resources for the future in the climate lab on working on the social cost of carbon. That is obviously something the Trump administration has decided um, that they do not want to use and they, and they indeed want to undermine. Our states recognize that it's vitally important to track the cost that carbon pollution is going to have on society and we're working to continue that data and that important work that those, those groups have been, have been involved in as well, um, not just related to the Climate Alliance but from the other governors that were there. Governor Inslee and Washington State is a member of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, uh, a problem faced by our, our nations, in Pacific Island nations, and indeed coastal communities across the world. Um, the, the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification announced new members and new commitments to, um, from world leaders to take action to protect oceans from the impacts of climate change. Uh, that group now is comprised of 55 members, both nations like, like France, states like Washington, cities, NGOs, tribes from, from around the world. Um, as you may have also seen in the news, Governors Inslee and Kate Brown, from a picture you see there, uh, happened to crash the, um, the, the party that was thrown by some elements of the Trump administration, which wanted to show up and, and talk about a, a pro-fossil fuel agenda. Uh, those governors decided that they'd, they'd hop on over to that event and talk about what their states are doing and what, what the U.S. Climate Alliance and, and similar states are doing in moving forward in a clean energy future uh, versus that, that type of agenda. And then lastly, you also see the logo of the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is um, a partnership that we've got going on the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, and also British Columbia that's been around since 2008 uh, with a particular focus on working together as a region to reduce carbon pollution, build clean energy, uh, examine things like ocean acidification, and otherwise work on a more sustainable um, uh, prosperous and, and secure clean energy future. Uh, so those are some of the elements that our governors brought to, to Bonn and some of the exciting things that we saw come out of it. 
Um, we felt, and I, and I think the global community, I, I think my colleagues would, would reiterate it as well, that it was important for the governors to be there. I think they felt that being there helped to encourage the international community that despite some of the announcements from the United States federal government, um, the United States is not out of the ball game, that there is hope for, and there's continued action in the United States uh, to address climate change and, and in partnership that there is still a broad swath of society here, we would argue majority of American society wants to continue as a part of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we believe, our states believe, Governor Inslee believes that American leadership is going to be crucial if we're going to address this challenge successfully and effectively, and so that uh, he, he's continuing his state and we're continuing this partnership of states on that trajectory. Uh, we think the states have, uh, have, uh, have had and can have a crucial role to play in this important challenge. So thank you all for being here again. Business has been a very, very important voice in all of these negotiations for years and years. And obviously, it takes many, many players to be able to kind of deliver the goods. Uh, nobody can do this by themselves in terms of thinking about the, the scale of the problem um, that our uh, global community is dealing with. And uh, we all need to find ways in which which all of these different sectors can be working and problem solving together. And uh, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy has been participating in all of these negotiations, has been an active presence for years and years. And uh, I am so pleased that Lisa Jacobson, who is the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, is with us today. Uh, I've worked closely with Lisa and the Business Council for years, and they are, have been uh, providing such important leadership in this whole community uh, and have been actively bringing people to together, both internationally as well as um, it, through the Business Council's work and lead, Lisa's leadership in terms of working with federal policymakers, also people in policy uh, positions at the state and local level. So Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Carol, and good afternoon, everybody. And I also would like to uh, extend a, a very uh, appreciative thank you and acknowledgement uh, to the ambassador. Your government was an excellent host, as well as to uh, Anton, on behalf of your government. Uh, the government of Germany was a, a good a supportive partner, and as you alluded to in some of your comments, was innovator in terms of making this particular kind of, kind of conference welcoming not only to the uh, national government negotiators, but also to the subnational communities like the private sector. So the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, uh, I'm proud to serve as its president has been a part of the Framework Convention on Climate Change process since the very early years. It was formed as an organization in 1992, and some of you may recall that was the year when the first Global Earth Summit occurred. It was in Rio de Janeiro, and it was really the birthplace of the Paris Agreement and all the agreements that have preceded it. That was when the Framework Convention on Climate Change was uh, brought to light. It is also uh, a, a time when we were working on the Montreal Protocol, and it was also that treaty was brought out of that process. And then there was two, two other global treaties, one on desertification and one on biodiversity that came out of that global summit. So it was really a transformative moment in time. And in addition to having these new global agreements on the major environmental issues facing the world. It also was really also a birthplace of bringing subnational actors together. And under many UN treaties, but I don't think any of them do it as well as the Framework Convention on Climate Change, there are constituency groups. There's nine under the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the business community has been a part of it since uh, those uh, treaties were founded. So. Having a legacy like that um, to allow the business community to play a constructive role, to share its views, and also work with governments collaborative, collaboratively to solve problems and to identify the policies that will lead to the results that these treaties seek to accomplish is just fundamental. And COP23 really, I think, was a breakthrough moment for that. And yes, there's a lot of discussion about the US federal government's positions, but 
I believe Anton mentioned it. I mean, this is something that had started at least a decade in a new way. There was a new conversation um, in the lead up to Paris, which was if we are successful in having very strong, ambitious, scientifically based climate um, targets globally, we cannot do it as national governments. We really need the implementers to be as close to the table as possible to work with us to make sure that we can meet or exceed those targets. And the business community is one of the pillars of implementation and also the finance that is needed to make it cost effective to reduce emissions on the scale that's being contemplated. So I saw at COP23 kind of a new moment in terms of how the business community can engage. And yes, part of it was to, just as the governors were there and other policymakers and other stakeholders were there from the US and North America to say we're still committed, um, it was also a time to continue to share expertise and to help that particular conference be successful. The Business Council for Sustainable Energy is just one of a number of business groups that have been very active in this process. Um, oh, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a slideshow for you. Let me let the slideshow go and then I'll um, stop. These are some of the images of some of the business community representatives at COP23. And you'll also see kind of a, a, a white igloo looking type structure. And that was the Climate Action Pavilion, which has never been done before on the scale um, as it was at COP23. I mean, it was probably the equivalent of six rooms of this size, um, large conference space for uh, you know, big forums, then it had some smaller uh, conference space, and then a big kind of atrium in the middle where everyone could gather. And this is, you know, what it looked like in the larger space during one of the, the signature events that were, that were going on. Let me see if I can stop. Hopefully this will stop now. Okay. Um, also, there was a sacred canoe image in the beginning. I just want to call that out. That was a, a, a feature. Um, in the bond zone, which is where civil society was, you could walk by it every day. And it just, I mean, for me, I mean, obviously it has a lot of significance for the culture um, and the leadership of the government of Fiji. But for me, it always said, we're all in the same boat. We all have to work together, business community, governments, other stakeholders, to get the, the very ambitious job uh, ahead of us done. So um, again, I want to thank uh, your government for its excellent, excellent hospitality and infusing that cooperative and you know, good feeling that, that we all had. So it really was accomplished, so well done. Um, so just to share a few thoughts um, on the business community. I mean, obviously the business community is very diverse. I mean, we represent in our own industries, uh, largely energy and transportation sector interests. Some of them are regulated under policies that um, would fall under the Paris Agreement national commitment. So maybe it's, uh, uh, power generation, reducing emissions at power plants, or maybe it's uh, in the automotive industries, reducing uh, emissions from uh, those fleets. It, it could be in buildings. It could also be in industrial processes. So we have members that are both impacted by policy, but also offer solutions to those policies in the marketplace, kind of similar to what Sam was discussing when he was talking about the uh, economic growth of climate solutions technologies in the state of Washington, and, and that state of Washington is a leader, but it's not alone. Um, so in the areas of energy efficiency, in the areas of renewable energy, in the areas of clean generation like natural gas, or in the transportation sectors or storage, that's the, the set of constituencies that the council represents. But when it comes to a forum like COP23, we aren't the only industries there. Um, there were some very big name companies uh, from Microsoft to um, Mars Candy that makes M&Ms. I mean, I mean, down the line, there were many different companies that you would recognize the name of that were there to talk about why they care about uh, sustainability and climate change mitigation and resiliency and adapt and adaptation for their own business interests as well as for their customers. Um, but they also see themselves as serving a larger marketplace, and they're doing it for sustainability, but primarily it's for the economic gains that they get and the enhancements to their own businesses. And for me, that was the, the clearest message that came across, that many of the companies that were there you know, didn't really speak to the environmental side of the equation. They really spoke to the job creation and the economic benefits to their companies and then to their customers. So that's, that's a bit of a sea change too in the way companies are thinking about climate change and sustainability. And it's not just on the margins. This is a mainstream set of views in the business community. 
So one other um, aspect that was mentioned is an initiative called We Are Still In, which is focused on the Paris Agreement. And I don't know, how, Laura, how many companies, a thousand companies now, I mean, 800, 900 companies have signed on to this pledge, which is very simple. It just says we are committed to uh, supporting the uh, the principles and the objectives of the Paris Agreement, and they mostly are U.S. and North American companies that have participated. But that type of initiative, yes, it was born out of the, the Trump administration's statements on the Paris Agreement, but it would have happened anyway in a different shape or form, and it was needed anyway. So I think that's really important for those of you that are um, here who, at some point, you know, obviously the Senate has a role in terms of ratifying international treaties, Think about that aspect of it. You know, there's a lot of discussion of the near-term politics, but this is a long-term issue. It's being dis been discussed over decades, and just as our own emissions, you know, at the end of last year were a 25-year low, um, we're doing this without um, imposing costs on consumers and businesses that are significant. When you look at the way our energy productivity trends have been, we are decoupling growth in our economy from energy use and emissions. So we are making significant progress, and this is all based on sound economics. So just as the markets are shifting, really the policy landscape is shifting. And with or without federal policies, the state and local level is going to be in the driver's seat and always needed to be. And so the business community is working hand in hand to tell that aspect of the story and also to be there to help guide, to make sure that any new policies, you know, don't derail the progress the markets are making and that they enable uh, more rapid and cost-effective emissions reductions and um, preparedness and resiliency planning when it comes to climate change. I, I want to have time for questions, and I, I think I probably will just make one last set of comments and, and close it there. First is to acknowledge Laura Tierney, who's our head of international programs and has really been leading our business delegations to the climate change negotiations for eight plus years. Um, she would be here, will be here to answer some questions in the discussion portion. But I also wanted to share a paper that the council released called Powering Ambition. And our whole message there was, look, we, if we, especially when we look at the cost reductions, we can do so much more than even just a few short years ago to reduce emissions, uh, get a bigger um, impact for every dollar spent because the costs have been coming down for so many solutions, technologies, there are new business models and deployment and scale has um, you know, changed the marketplace. So a lot of our focus was to tell that economic story, but we also did care very specifically about different aspects of the negotiations themselves. You know, making sure that we continue to have a transparent and accountable Paris Agreement rule book um, and that process has, has been started, and we felt good that it was keeping to we're all in this together on a shared common goal mentality as opposed to having you know, different countries with different requirements and different understandings of what the challenge is. The Paris Agreement really was a landmark agreement in that it brought everybody together under a common agenda and common um, set of ambitions. And it also retained you know, the opportunity for some na subnational governments to be involved. And then looking ahead, we're gonna be involved in the Tanaloa Dialogue. We're gonna provide our input. Um, and that also is a very new and an innovative uh, type of initiative at a really critical time. So I commend, again, your government for bringing that to that, this forum, and we want to take up the opportunity to share our views through that process. But there's a, there's a lot, many more issues that we do care about in the climate change negotiations themselves, and you can read more about it on this paper, which is on our website, www.bcse.org. And happy to participate in the conversation for a few minutes, and then Laura will take over for me. So thank you very much, Carol. Appreciate your leadership at EESI. Thanks so much, Lisa. OK, we have a few minutes for questions or comments. Uh, so does anyone have a question that they would like to ask our wonderful panel? Jared. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you. My name is Jared Blum. I happen to be chair of ESI, so I'm thrilled about putting this on, putting this on together with, with the four of you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for many of us here in the United States, the issue of climate has become very partisan and very 
un, we have an inability to, to realize its consequences, even though we've had the kind of disastrous weather events. Could you articulate for us a little bit, for, and for people who are watching online as well, the kinds of things that Fiji is engaged in to try and protect its people, and indeed your island nations that are around you, to the, to the extent that this is a real and present danger for people now. We have to realize that. Could you articulate that a little for us? Well, thank you for the uh, question, Jared. Uh, uh, for Fiji and the Pacific Island uh, region, the issue of uh, adaptation is an ongoing and, and a current uh, challenge for us. Um, we have uh, relocated communities. We have identified about uh, uh, 30 uh, villages that uh, needed to be relocated in the, in the next year. And uh, these are communities uh, that are coastal based. And uh, like uh, most uh, island countries, our, uh, our development uh, model has always been coastal based. Our towns and cities, our roads, they've always been built uh, along the, the coast. And uh, for a country that depends uh, um, a lot on tourism, for example, most of the uh, multi-billion dollar investment in tourism are uh, coastal based. And this is a huge challenge for, for a small island developing state like Fiji on how do we respond to the erosion of uh, coastal areas, the threat of tsunamis on, uh, on, on the coast. And uh, to us, it's been integrated into our development agenda and our development uh, plans. Uh, the need to uh, build resilience by moving people away from the coast. It's not an easy uh, task. Uh, you know, like when you, when you try to convince uh, islanders to move away from the ocean, uh, it's like um, a new phenomenon for them. So we need to work with communities to, to do that. Uh, with regards to our neighbors in the Pacific Islands, uh, Fiji takes its role as a regional hub uh, very seriously. We are very mindful that our neighbors to the north of us are very prone to sea level rise. Countries like Kiribati and Tuvalu, a change in uh, centimeters in sea level rise has huge impact on their, on their livelihood. So Fiji has, uh, has been a home to these communities uh, for a number of years now. There, there's um, uh, migration to, to Fiji. Uh, they're building up the communities uh, in Fiji. And also the Fijian government has allocated land for both Tuvalu and Kiribati, where uh, it is starting off uh, to address the issue of food security, where they can come and plant their food or ra raise their food for, for export back to their countries. But eventually we, we accept that these lands that are being bought by Kiribati and the Tuvalu government will eventually uh, serve as, uh, as settlements for their, for their population. And those are the, the issues that we are addressing within our country and within our region in terms of providing adaptation policies. Thank you. We're having similar issues in Alaska, for moving villages as well. Um, so we perhaps get some lessons from what you all are doing in Fiji. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Mara, could you also speak to the food issue a little bit? and? And once again, the reliance on the sea. As I mentioned in my uh, presentation, that uh, one of the the agenda that Fiji took to COP23 is to uh, strengthen the linkage between a healthy ocean and climate change. Because for island countries, our livelihood is mainly from the the ocean, and uh, sadly, it's 
now being uh, a yearly occurrence during the summer that uh, in the Pacific Island countries that villages are waking up to uh, um, strong uh, uh, decomposing smell coming from the ocean. And these are reef fishes that are just dying off because of the increase in ocean uh, temperature. It's no longer an isolated incident. It ha it's happening in Fiji, in Kiribati, in Tuvalu, and all throughout the, the Pacific Island region. And to us, this goes to uh, impact on the issue of, um, of food security. Uh, not only on the availability of, uh, of food for coastal communities, but also as a source of pro protein. We are not big dairy eaters uh, or users. Uh, we rely on the ocean uh, from, uh, for those uh, uh, protein. So it has this multiple impact on, on the health of coastal communities and also on the security of the food uh, that they uh, rely on. Which is pretty profound in terms of thinking about how much of this is already, is already underway. Um, and of course, Sam mentioned that too in terms of what you were already seeing off the coast of, of um, the Pacific Northwest, off, off, a lot, uh, off Washington State. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Sergio Martinez, and I am a former intern in the Energy, Climate Change, and Extractive Industries Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. And I have a question for Mr. Anton Hofnack. So my, I, I, I want to ask you two questions about the NDCs and the climate, climate funding. In regards to the NDCs, I'm wondering if you, how do you see the, these monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to assess comparability about the, the contribution that each country is seeking? So far, countries just have implemented or have passed on strategic plannings, but besides law, regulations, or policies, what kind of progress does the international community expect to see in that regard? And in terms of climate finance, how do you see innovative financial mechanisms in, that increase private sector participation and non-state actors in terms of, of uh, covering the one, $100 billion cap? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, on the, the first piece, um, the NDCs and the, the transparency on um, communicating NDCs, but then also on implementing NDCs is, is really the, the core of the rulebook negotiations that is happening right now. Um, and we've, uh, we, we have now, um, NDCs have been submitted by, by almost any, every party to the, the Paris Agreement. Um, and for now, those, those NDCs are very, very different. Um, some of those are, are very, very quantified as the, the US NDC, um, reduce emissions by 26 to 28% from 2005 to 2025. Um, the European Union's NDC reduce emissions by, uh, by 2030 by 40%. Um, those, are, those are very quantifiable. Um, but then of course we have NDCs, Fiji's NDC, 30% by 2030. Um, then of course we have NDCs that are much less quantifiable. Um, and may not even relate to, to mitigation, but may relate to adaptation. How do we quantify adaptation commitments? Um, is, that, is that merely in terms of finance, or maybe is there another way? Um, potentially, it's about creating food security for you know, a certain part of your, of your population, as the ambassador just, just mentioned. Um, so that's the discussion that's taking place right now, which will then inform how NDCs in 2020, because we're looking for um, the next commitment period uh, will be the NDCs from 2025 to, to 2030. Those will be formulated after 2020. How can these be formulated in a more coherent and a more comparable way? Um, that's that's a, the discussions that are taking place in the, in the rulebook uh, negotiations. Um, the transparency Working group has been has been making progress in Bonn, um, led by um, a um, um, led by um, the chairs from um, China and the U.S. Two nations that have kind of started the whole transparency conversation ahead of Paris and are still continuing now. Um, so we're looking forward to um, to their contributions in 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 Katowice. There's reluctance by some countries to 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 quantify. Um, but there's, um, I think, a, a larger and, and growing majority of countries 
that is looking for, um, for, for numbers in those NDCs. Um, so that's, that is good. That is something we're looking forward to. Um, your, your second question on... Uh, it was on climate, climate finance in terms of how do you see the private sector and non-state actors? Yeah. So there's, um, there's the 100 billion goal, and it's important to know that that's not just public finance, but it's public finance and publicly motivated private finance. Uh, and we've seen that that second number grow tremendously. Um, the conference, the One Planet Summit in, in Paris that uh, President Macron, but also the Secretary General of the United Nations and the President of the World Bank have invited um, the world community to, was especially focused on how do we mobilize private finance. The World Bank at its, its meetings this year um, had how do we mobilize private finance for climate change as one of the main topics. Um, and again, that alludes to what uh, what Lisa was saying for the Sustainable Business Council before, it's, it's not there's a sustainability case, but for businesses, the business case is so much more enticing because they're working for their shareholders. Um, and we've, we've seen that the, the business case is becoming more and more clear. And now it's how do we make that business case, like the, the, the very last kind of step that we need to take as, as governments, whether it's you know, on the national level or on the subnational level, what's the final step we need to take to, to make that business model as enticing as it needs to be? For a lot of these business models, that's the case. In, in Germany this year, we had the first offshore wind auction uh, that went out for zero subsidies. So that's very clearly um, an area where the, the, the state can now step away from, let investors do their thing. Um, there's other areas um, especially in developing countries uh, where, because of credit risk, for example, countries, um, sorry, businesses are more reluctant to, to step forward. So how can we as, as governments um, facilitate and motivate that, that, that private investment is, I think, the, the big question um, going forward um, for next year, year after next. And I think what's, what's important is that we, we, we analyze how we as governments are are able to help, but also how we as governments potentially are doing the opposite of helping. Um, the G20 has a, has a conversation on fossil fuel subsidies, uh, where we've seen that in, in developed countries even, uh, there's huge amounts of public money going into fossil fuels. Um, the first step would be to look at those subsidies and you know, reduce those subsidies to, to zero as soon as possible and then potentially channel some of that money into, into cleaner sources of, of energy in line with the Paris Agreement. Anton, I was just going to mention that, that with regard to statements by the G20, the G7, the G8, uh, over the past few years there have been a number of, of things uh, or statements that have come forward saying we need to address the subsidy issue. Do you think that this is finally going to happen now? in terms of the G20? Sure. So in terms of the G20, uh, we've, we've made the decision in, in Elmau during the German G20 presidency um, that we would investigate fossil fuel subsidies in G20 countries in a peer review process. Um, the United States and China were the first countries to engage, um, to engage on, that, on that peer review. They have since published their results. Um, Germany and Mexico are currently peer reviewing their subsidies, so we're, we're now getting um, enough data and actual government official data on these subsidies. Um, and I think once we have a number of these peer reviews ready, um, there will be even more pressure um, from, the, um, from the NGOs, from the private sector to attack these, these subsidies. And quite frankly, um, when we're looking at the 100 billion goal, uh, if we're able to divert some of those subsidies to the adaptation and mitigation funds that are needed by developing countries, um, you know, we'd be doing them a, a huge favor. Um, so I think it's, it's looking at these fossil fuel subsidies and, and looking at especially um, ending these subsidies and not creating new ones, right? There's a, um, there's a discussion in this country on new effectively subsidies for coal-fired power plants. Um, really the, the decisions of the G20, um, not just the Paris Agreement, but any, anyone who's interested in, in mitigating carbon emissions. And this is this goal of 
mitigating carbon emissions has found the universal support of all G20 countries at the summit in Hamburg this year. Um, so really anyone who's interested in simply mitigating greenhouse gas emissions um, should, be, should be very much looking at, uh, at public subsidies as the kind of first and very obvious step to do so. Any last question? Okay, well, I wanted to just ask Laura a question quickly. And in terms of, in terms of your experience in coming out of Bonn, what do you see as a sort of the, the key ask or message then coming from the business community, your, either your members or in terms of thinking about all of the folks that you were interacting with? So where are, what, what, what are the members of the Business Council looking for from this process um, going forward? Is that your question? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or action on climate change? Um, well, I think Lisa well art articulated that um, this is a long journey that we've been on for over two decades where business has been a part of this climate discussion. And now that we have the Universal Agreement and the Paris Agreement, the inclusion of all stakeholders, including business, um, the, the site really turns to the implementation. And I hate to use these terms that get thrown around very um, loosely, but what does implementation mean? It means, you know, the op working with the state and local opportunities and the partners that um, Washington State, for example, sh showcased here today. Um, there is going to be, on the political side, there's going to be an event in San Francisco hosted by Governor Brown in California in September that is going to try to galvanize what is happening um, by subnational actors um, around the world. And we want to be a part of that. Um, and, and we look for continued uh, national leadership uh, to, to get us through to the next to the next um, iteration, not the iteration of the Paris Agreement, but we have to get down to the business of implementing and reducing emissions and building more resilient communities. So um, I think there's been a lot of political attention and, need, and, 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 and it's much needed political attention, but sometimes that can get, that can complicate um, the taking of the action of the creating of the markets for these more uh, efficient technologies, the cleaner sources of energy. So. Um, we're here and ready to partner with uh, your bosses uh, back in your home states and then also with the governments such as Fiji, Germany and others in the United States government delegation as well. So, thank you. Thanks. And Sam, just quickly, I wanted to ask whether, whether you saw, uh, whether you anticipate that there will be other governors that whether through NGA or through the Western Governors Association that will be willing to step forward based upon what they are now seeing from all of your experience coming out of COP? Uh, thank you, Carol. It's a good question. I, absolutely. I think the, the, the short answer is absolutely. You're going to see more governors join. When we, when we launched this, again, it was three governors, Inslee and, and Brown and Cuomo, who, who launched it. But even in the hours since making the announcement, uh, even really prior to making the announcement, other states were signing on, and that continued as sort of as a rush through the first week after President Trump announced uh, the United States would, would be leaving the Paris Climate Agreement. Since then, others have joined, and again, crucially and importantly, it's bipartisan. You know, this shouldn't be, um, but unfortunately has been cast, this being climate policy and climate action has been cast in an unfortunately partisan lens and in much of policy making across the country. But um, this is a bipartisan coalition, and, and you're certainly to see it, it grow. We're talking with, other, with a number of other states, some whom you might not expect to be the, the the first to the to the to the game about them joining as well, uh, and I think you're going to continue seeing it um, through this year, and then after next year, there's um, uh, there's going to be a, a large turnover uh, in and also in gubernatorial leadership uh, next year with so many uh, most states, 36 states have elections and many governors are retiring. You're going to see probably a fair amount of turnover ahead of 2019, and I think as important as anything is that. I've seen the dialogue and the political lens on climate change shift just in the last year in the United States, having worked in this policy space for a decade, um, and, and others can, I'm sure, talk about even prior, the, the attention, the way it was talked about um, in the political sphere, in the news media, I think has decidedly changed. I think, I think more and more Americans, first of all, understand that it's happening as we speak. Again, not a sort of a future or abstract problem or not a problem at all. 
uh, and I think they understand that there are solutions to be to be had and to be implemented, and I think they're eager to do that. And I think that uh, Americans have sort of recoiled at at the United States at a national level, at a federal level, saying we don't want to be a part of this global community in this way anymore. Uh, I think, by and large, Americans want to see quite the opposite happen, and I think you're going to see uh, more and more of them speak out and say that, and, and in turn, that will lead to more elected leaders at all levels of government uh, taking action and, and pursuing policy goals towards that end. Great. Thank you. And I want to say, please join me in thanking our wonderful, wonderful panel, and really, really appreciate all your being here. And thank you all so much. And please, we look forward to working with all of you in the months ahead. Thanks. Thank